Uh, just a few minutes until we cross uh, to our remote speakers, Oscar Berry and Frederick uh, Berriason. Uh, they're going to be talking about sustainable digital work life and uh, the four pillars of a solid digital workspace and security. So we're changing tack a little bit. You know, over the days, we're going to be covering a lot of different topics from uh, workplace, uh, you know, uh, remote leadership, sustainability. Yep, yep. And uh, we just uh, had just got a message from the control room, a little bit of problem uploading the photos at the moment due to the platform being jammed with so many people uh, uploading photos at the same time. So I'm going to cross now. We're going to cross to Oscar Berry and Frederick Berriason. And uh, Oscar is the digital strategist at Telia. And Oscar works as a digital strategist where he helps Telia's clients navigate the digital landscape and sees digital opportunities specifically to improve employee experience and create a smarter working life. And Oscar has written several books on this topic uh, and on digitalization uh, with titles such as Superpowering People and Digital Workplace Strategy and Design. And Oscar, it's great that you can join us here today. Could you just tell me, I'm really curious about Superpowering People. What, what is that book about? Sorry, I didn't get to the last part. Yeah, because, uh, I just was asking was about your, you have a book called Superpowering People. And I was wondering if you could tell us yeah. what that book's about. Uh, well, I, I definitely can. It's uh, really about um, these kind of times that we're living in right now. How to empower people to, uh, to work and organizations to, to work virtually uh, to, to sort of... Uh, uh, get get away from what I call the curse of physical proximity that we need to be together to to uh, communicate and get work done. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, we don't need to be. We can also create virtual proximity, uh, which is another subject. It's not the subject for this uh, talk, but mm -hmm. perhaps uh, another talk later on. But I love that expression, the curse of physical proximity. Wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce your co-pilot for this uh, session. You're going to be co-moderating this session with Frederick Berriason, Cybersecurity Business Manager at SciGate. And Frederick primarily uh, focuses on services and solutions that prevent cyber attacks and mitigate risk and damage while companies are going through their digital transformation. And Frederick has worked in the security field for over 20 years and has been guiding clients in both the technical and strategic areas. And he's a frequent public speaker and is also has a professional security experience from the Asia Pacific region for over a decade. Frederick, welcome. Which Asia Pacific regions did you work in, if you don't mind me asking? I, I lived in Sydney for 10 years and then uh, worked hometown. all over the Asia Pacific region. My yeah. hometown. Where, whereabouts in Sydney are you from? I'm from Manly Beach, the most beautiful place in the no. world. No way. I used to live on Wentworth Street for, uh, for 10 years, man. We, we were probably neighbors yeah. for more than a decade and we didn't really, we never, we never yeah, knew it, but world. here we are. We're joined by the, the power of digital <laughs> uh, connection. So, Oscar. Yeah, we'll have if, to catch up one day. Absolutely. Oscar, if you would like to begin the presentation and Frederick, you take over when your slide comes up. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, well, of course, I'm very excited to be here and we are excited to be part of this event and uh, to get the opportunity to share our insights about what it takes to create a sustainable digital work life and uh, also how important that is for digital transformation of a business. So I'm thinking let's get right to it. Um, <coughs> trying to navigate the control of the slides here and it works fine. So. Um, when we talk about digital work life, it's it's absolutely necessary to start with our digital lives outside of work, because uh, today we get um, the latest technology and the most innovative digital services consumers first and not at work, as it used to be a number of years ago. So um, we readily adopt new tools and services if they make our lives more convenient and fulfilling. And as we do, what happens is that our expectations uh, of how we interact with organizations and the products and services increase. And uh, this kind of these expectations, they, they continue to increase. And 
the ever rising expectations will create what we call uh, uh, an expectations gap. Uh, what I tried to illustrate in this picture, a gap between what we as consumers expect on one hand and the ability of an organization to meet these expectations on the other. And the main reason for this gap is that organizations, when they grow, they become slower to change, but also that they uh, work ineffectively internally. For example, not being very good at collaborating across the organization, across silos, uh, not being able to step out of their uh, different silos. One other thing aspect to think about in this respect is also that the, the, the kind of the nature of the work we do as humans is, is changing um, as, as, uh, as a consequence of uh, new technologies and digitalization for, for like machines and robots that started replacing physical routine work long ago. And in recent years, uh, we have seen computers and software replacing routine knowledge work as well. And what that means for us as humans is that the future of work is uh, non-routine or what I would like to call creative uh, knowledge work. Uh, and this is what you see in the upper right uh, quadrant of this model. And this kind of work uh, is highly collaborative uh, by nature. And, and re it requires a bit uh, problem solving and ability to improvise and so on. And this is the kind of work that organizations must be able to support to be competitive and to close the expectations gap. In essence, uh, they must be able to create an environment where people are able to develop and leverage these kind of uh, abilities. A part of this, of course, is to be able to attract and retain people who are already really good at uh, this kind of work. And these people, uh, these people often seek a, a purpose, or, uh, seek a sense of purpose at work, uh, to do something meaningful. And uh, this is often said to be important to younger generations, but it's actually really important to creative knowledge workers in general. They also expect uh, to get trusted by the leaders and the peers, of course, and to be able to practice self-leadership in their work. Autonomy is a really big thing for creative knowledge workers. And then uh, as creative knowledge workers, uh, we rely a lot on collaborating with other people. So uh, creative knowledge workers, of course, expect a collaborative culture and an environment where collaboration is made simple and encouraged. Last but not least, uh, they expect flexibility. That is the freedom and support to work when and where it suits them best. So the question is how, how are organizations performing when it comes to creating in, in this kind of environment, enabling this, uh, uh, these kind of abilities for, for creative knowledge workers? Well, uh, a majority of organizations still have just established basic capabilities for digital working. Uh, for example, enabled some remote work. And it, it takes a lot of effort to become advanced as an organization to, uh, organization to really work digitally throughout the organization. And it's not just about technology, it's as much or even more about soft factors such as values and behaviors, uh, skills, leadership styles and so forth. But even when it comes to technology, a majority cannot access all the tools they need to get the work done remotely. And uh, now um, enter the times of uh, that we're living right now, the corona pandemic. We all know that the organizations uh, had to shift literally overnight from relying on physical presence as the foundation of getting work done to doing 100% of the work remotely, uh, if possible. Uh, offices were closed, uh, business travel forbidden, and those of us who are knowledge workers and who can do our work from anywhere, at least in theory, we were suddenly forced to use digital tools to perform our work from home or elsewhere. And on top of this, if this is not enough, we are living in a VUCA world on steroids right now. If we thought things were highly volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous before, then what we are experiencing right now is extreme. 
Uh, it's safe to say that we never experienced something like this before. It is very hard to plan for the future. Uh, the need for agility and trying to understand and make sense of what is happening has never been higher than now. So how do we deal with this in practice? Well, we are using the same kind of solutions that most of us have been using for a long time to help us align with each other and collaborate. Meetings. The main difference now is that the meetings have gone digital and by that, by that I mean video meetings. We are using video meetings for everything right now. Whether it, it is to become aware of what's happening in the organization or in the team, or if it's tr to create something together or to coordinate tasks or to share information with each other and so on. Why is this a problem then? Well, this is how the workday looks right now for many people. One video meeting after the other, back to back, with hardly any time in between to even grab a cup of coffee or some fresh air. Uh, another thing is that the variation of tasks and environments that used to make each workday a bit different, different are now virtually gone. So it becomes harder to separate one day from the other. And that could, uh, for some people uh, at least, create a feeling of being part of the movie Groundhog Day. You know, the movie where Bill Murray's character becomes trapped in a time loop and forcing him to endlessly repeat. So the next day looks the same as the previous and so forth. A key question that we all need to ask uh, ourselves in this situation and going forward is, are we in fact paving cow paths? Are we just translating our existing ways of working to digital platforms, copying old behaviors and pasting them into new digital tools? The thing is, we could achieve substantial improvements if we just change our ways of working. If we understand how these new digital tools can help us solve the same problems in new ways. And of course, that we also change our behaviors accordingly. So could we do different? Yeah, we definitely could, we can. There are many other tools uh, that allow us to get our work done digitally. Those of us who have worked in virtual teams and uh, uh, for a long time, we know this already. Uh, you can use a lot of different tools to, to work together digitally without having to be present in real time all the time with video. For example, to create awareness of what you're doing, you can write posts that show up in the feeds of the people you work together with. You can co-create using digital whiteboards with your team and other stakeholders or whoever you need to co-create with. You can coordinate using chat, planner boards such as Microsoft Planner and so forth. You can share information in various uh, uh, in different kinds of channels from social networks and webcasts to, uh, to, uh, to chat. So there, there's a lot of different possibilities uh, that you need to explore, not just copy paste uh, your existing ways of working to digital tools. The thing is right now we have been dealing with the acute here and now, but we also right now need to look further on and raise our perspective uh, and, and uh, to, to uh, not just deal with the acute situation, but also uh, plan for a restart and a return to a kind of new normal. So uh, a big question then uh, is, of course, what is this uh, new normal? And it is, of course, what we make it to, uh, but I believe some things are sure, almost sure to happen. So why not plan for those? Uh, one thing we can be pretty sure of is that digitalization will increase. So if we put our uh, uh, this on hold in our organizations, uh, then we're really doing ourselves a disservice. Secondly, there will be a shift to digital working, and which is, uh, as I've just said, not just limited to video meetings. We must fundamentally transform our ways of working so that we can work together as a virtual organization. Thirdly, a, a, a key part in this transformation will be to um, uh, shift to, towards digital co-creation rather than just using digital tool, tools for communicating and coordinating uh, tasks. And all these things will, of course, require a shift 
uh, from managing people to leading people and to be able to do so virtually with a distributed workforce. And last but not least, the focus will uh, shift from deploying digital tools um, and let the employees make, kind of make sense out of them to actually improving productivity and trying to avoid to increase digital stress. But sustainable working, sustainable digital working, it is more than just tools and ways of working. It is about creating a sustainable digital work life uh, as a whole for the employees. And to do that, we must put the employee and employee experience front and center. We must look at the work environment holistically, developing the physical and the digital work environments together with the development of the organizational and social work environment. Top management, this means that top management, HR, IT, communication, facilities, who, whatever functions, supporting functions you have that uh, are, are sort of influencing and making this environment possible, they must all work closely together. And there is also, uh, 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 last but not least, there's also another pillar of a sustainable digital work life, and that is security. It's better to talk about this than my colleague Frederick, who's an expert on this subject. So I guess it's time for me to hand over to you, Frederick. All right, perfect. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, so uh, when it comes to security, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's a good idea to start by uh, by having a look at where are we right now from a security perspective. And um, I'm sure everyone on this webcast and everyone that opens uh, a, a website today that reading reading ge just general news or uh, just opens uh, the normal daily newspaper will have the opportunity to read something about the increase of challenges of cyber related incidents and cyber crime. And if we take a look at the current situation that we're in right now with a global pandemic, uh, cyber criminals have been very aggressive on using these um, these times to uh, to serve uh, to service their needs. All of us are very interested in in the latest news. We're interested in news that are external on on trends and what's happening around the world, and we're also very interested in trends and what's happening inside our own companies. Perhaps there are changes on uh, with rules and policies on how we can work. Perhaps there's uh, uh, some cutbacks and, and staff that unfortunately we need to be, to be let go and so on. And criminals are, of course, using these uh, to uh, uh, make sure that uh, we fall in the traps and that we click on links and that we do things that, that service their needs. And um, uh, if we look about, back uh, a couple of years, we could see a big shift in where hackers or the, the cyber criminals teamed up with uh, traditional organized crime and formed a, day, a really strong bond uh, where the cyber bandits on their side uh, use technology to commit crime and organized crime on the other hand uh, were able uh, to um, use their skills and, and expertise in sort of uh, laundering money and taking money out of the equation. So these uh, uh, two together formed a really strong band and at these times of course when we have um, uh, a lockdown in, in many parts of the world, traditional organized crime activities cannot take place. Uh, the, uh, the smuggling of illicit drugs and people and so on cannot take place at the same uh, rate as it us usually does. Hence, a big push uh, on cyber-related crime and a really, really big upswing in, uh, in, uh, in this area. We even see warnings from, from institutes like the, the World Health Organization talking about cyber-related uh, crime uh, connected to the, the coronavirus. Uh, so really challenging times these days and uh, difficult for employees and uh, for organizations uh, managing and protecting themselves when you're not working with the same tools that you used to and when you're working in different ways and, and from different locations. So tough, tough challenge. So what, what is the, uh, the answer then and what, what, uh, what do organizations need to do to uh, uh, make sure that uh, we can digitize and, and make use of modern ways of working and, and making use of all the fantastic technology and fantastic innovative ways there are of working? Well, uh, it's cooperation. Uh, that is the key here. We need to cooperate very, very closely with, uh, um, uh, with our peers to make sure that we, uh, we solve the security challenges. And cooperation 
thing for me happens in in three different ways. Uh, the first way of looking at cooperation, I think, is uh, yeah, an internal perspective. Uh, there's no better way of putting this, I think, than that we're all in the same boat here, literally on on this uh, racing boat, where where you really need to have the same pace when you're rowing. Uh, if you don't have the same pace, uh, you won't win the race. And um, uh, when it comes to uh, an organization undergoing big change and an organization that's undergoing big change that needs to get help from a security perspective, of course, these uh, needs to be aligned. And of course, we also need to work on sort of rowing this boat in, in the same pace for this to be successful. And when we talk to organizations, and I spent a long time talking to organizations of various sizes and scales from, from many different uh, segments of the market, uh, a common uh, challenge that uh, organizations mention to us is that there are not enough people that work with security tasks for the organization to be able to, to take up the, the speed that they want and to be able to achieve the, the changes and, and uh, achieve the goals that they, they need. So really critical for an organization to involve security departments early on and at the same time really important for security departments to work together with the rest of, of the organization so that jointly we can, we can uh, make uh, the organization better and cooperate in projects at the same pace, not just asking for security advice just a few days before launch of a new initiative. It's also really important to uh, take a look at um, uh, what you can do to uh, cooperate with uh, others externally. Now, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the playing field is not even and uh, the game of security is not played uh, where two teams of equal number of players meet each other and, and can head up in, in a rugby scrum. Uh, the challenge that we have is that uh, a security department is more or less a one-man band or, uh, yeah, at least figuratively, a, uh, a one-man show against an entire team of adversaries. Uh, so here it's really important to make sure that, uh, that you work with external uh, uh, parties and uh, cooperate with others. Uh, and I can honestly say that uh, we at Telia and Sygate, we cooperate a lot with uh, with other external companies. We even cooperate with our competition. It might sound a little bit strange, but uh, both formally and informally, we, ch we share a lot of security related uh, knowledge uh, in networks that we have uh, in order to uh, uh, prevent cybercrime and, and cyber incidents uh, from, from occurring. So I encourage all of you to, uh, to think about your network and think about uh, expanding your network uh, and learning from others, possibly even uh, uh, someone who is in the same field and possibly even someone who is a competitor of yours to talk about what, uh, what you've done and what they've done to secure, secure uh, uh, your digital paths and your digital projects. Uh, we find that rarely are security departments uh, 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 hiding things from other uh, peers. We're, we're looking at uh, cooperating and, and collaborating much more than we're looking at keeping, keeping things uh, secret. And of course, it's also important to take a look at uh, are there opportunities of collaborating in, in certain types of ecosystems. Ecosystems uh, uh, is, is, of course, a, a quite broad term, but from, from the um, yeah, corporate perspective, what I mean by ecosystems here are partnerships, uh, perhaps customers, perhaps uh, suppliers or vendors that you cooperate with. Make sure that you can early on identify who you need to work with, share ideas, talk about challenges, uh, what type of uh, new projects that you run and solve the security challenges in a good way this way, not reinventing the wheel and making sure that you have the networks needed so that um, when something occurs, it's easy for you to pick up the phone or send out a quick message. Last thing you want to do, and trust me on this, last thing you want to do is sit in a support line waiting to get hold of someone who's in charge of IT through the normal switchboard or through the normal support queue. When a cyber incident happens, uh, you need to have a strong, solid network that you can rely upon. And this might sound like um, um, a little bit of um, uh, an introduction to uh, cooperation and a little bit of uh, philosophy. I'd say that it's a view that we have, it's not just my own, it's a view that we have at Atelier and Saget that cooperation is really key and, and, and critical to success within the security field. Uh, and I'd like to really emphasize this, this is not just about technology and it's not really a main part of our technology. Of course, there's technology and there's uh, uh, products and services and expertise required to, to make things happen, but it's more about an attitude and it's more about an attitude of, of how to work uh, with security in the digitalization in the digital context, really, that, that's the key part we have. 
And why not then look at other industries to get inspired by how others operate their business and how others operate uh, their normal days and, and uh, reuse some tools and methods that other uh, companies and organizations have been, have been using. And I think uh, one area that um, is good to take a look at, uh, uh, especially in these days, is taking a look at how um, uh, the healthcare system has, uh, has battled many types of challenges uh, when it comes to uh, what they do day by day. Um, in, in the healthcare system, there are historically been lots of issues long before the corona pandemic around nosocomical infections. Uh, infections that you receive uh, after having had surgery, for instance, uh, where you um, uh, need uh, uh, a lot of uh, help, uh, even uh, you might end up in an intensive care unit after quite a, a simple surgical uh, procedure. And um, uh, the World Health Organization did lots of um, <clears throat> surveys and took a look at what, uh, what happens in in, uh, in the healthcare system where, where we have very few nosocomical infections and what happens where we have lots. And uh, actually it was as simple as developing a checklist for what to do. And as you can see on the screen here, uh, the World Health Organization uh, surgical checklist, it starts with something as simple as ensuring that we have the right patient on the operating table. And it uh, goes through a number of quite simple steps and it ends with uh, what do we need to do when um, the patient leaves the operating theater and what do we need to do, what, what kind of uh, post uh, procedures do we need to do. And just implementing quite a simple checklist like this um, had a huge impact. Uh, the, the reason why it, ha it has a huge impact is that unless we uh, do lots of mapping, planning and practice, we make really, really poor decisions uh, while we're under stress and pressure. Uh, uh, same thing goes when we're working from home remotely or when we're undergoing big, big change in, in how we do our daily tasks. When we're under a lot of stress and, un stress and under a lot of pressure, we, we really make poor decisions. And uh, implementing this WHO checklist, uh, it reduced the um, nosocomial infections a lot, as you can see on the slide here. It even in, uh, reduced the number of deaths uh, related to nosocomial infections in North America by over 20%. So uh, massive impact uh, from doing something as simple as, as having a checklist. And I think this is something important to, uh, to remember. Why not make use of good procedures and good ways of operating uh, from other industries, third parties that have uh, done a lot of studies and have uh, taken a look at things, get inspired by this and make use of, of the same type of tools and methodology and, and translate that in, into your own business. It is really difficult for someone that's working from home from the first time to know what to do. So have a simple checklist on use the right equipment, the right tools for collaboration and so on, uh, and take the following steps when you're, when you're launching a new product, project. Make sure that you cover the following facts. This will uh, make your life a lot simpler and it will also help out and inc increase security a lot. Now, regardless of uh, where you are today and where you're heading, everyone is on a fantastic and very interesting journey. Now, uh, regardless of if you're heading towards that, um, uh, that peak in, in, in the far distance, or perhaps you're heading to a peak that's a little bit closer by, you need to have the right equipment, you need to have the right skill sets, you need to have the right team with you to make sure that uh, this journey is, success, uh, is a success. And for us, uh, it's always about helping customers understand, uh, number one, of course, where we are heading, but number two, figuring out where are we today so that we can make sure that we plan uh, by putting the right team together, making sure that you have the right equipment. Uh, the Alpine skier here should for, uh, perhaps have a helmet on. Let's make sure that we get helmets for everyone uh, who's going to take part in this uh, interesting expedition. And of course, make sure that you have the rest of the equipment required uh, and the, the right type of training to, uh, to traverse uh, the, uh, uh, the mountains and, and, and the valleys that you have uh, in front of you. Uh, so figuring out uh, what your goal is, where, where you're heading from a digitalization point of view, but also, of course, from a security point of view is, is critical. And after that, making sure that you know where you stand today so that you can make a good plan and make sure that you get the right equipment, skills and assistance that you need um, in order to do this in the most effective way. So if I'm um, to uh, uh, sort of summarize the... Um, um, 
lessons that uh, we've uh, brought with us in in six key points. I think one thing is to consider yourself and, and think about your role in your organization from a digitalization point of view, from a remote working point of view, and from a security point of view, that you are the oil in the machinery here. You cannot be, as a security department, the, the, the team that always says no. And from a digitalization point of view, you can't be the team that always includes the security department at the last minute. So make sure that uh, uh, you actively uh, seek out each other and make sure that you actively get involved in each other in, in each other's projects so that you can you can help out. Uh, like I just mentioned, I think it's really important to practice, learn, and get inspired by others. And also, of course, uh, celebrate and uh, look at uh, success where, where parts of the organization has cooperated closely. Make sure that you celebrate these and, and publicly celebrate them in front of the rest of your organization. It's, all really, uh, it's also really important to make sure to, to work uh, towards KPIs, you know, key performance indicators. And uh, looking at, uh, at KPIs for security is, is not something that most organizations are very familiar with. But we are very familiar with working towards KPIs from a marketing perspective, from a sales perspective, from a headcount perspective, from financial perspectives. We're using KPIs to steer lots of things inside organizations. And for security work to be successful, we need to work at setting uh, KPIs and making sure that we steer towards these. And they could be KPIs of um, uh, awareness training. They could be KPIs on uh, uh, time to detect some kind of cyber incident and time to uh, react and act towards cyber incidents. Uh, the, the right KPIs is, of course, something that you need to set up and uh, agree upon inside your organization with the, the appropriate type of advice that you need. But make sure that you steer towards KPIs with security as well, not just the finance, marketing, and sales teams working with, towards KPIs. And again, get pro proactive, get involved, and, and uh, join the relevant ecosystem that's uh, 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 near you. We have an ecosystem of many uh, kinds of, of security offerings, uh, but choose the right type of ecosystem for you because there are a lot of skills and there are a lot of talented people out there in the industry who are willing to share and willing to learn, and an ecosystem is an awesome way to make sure that you uh, get, get forward. So with that, I, I wrap up uh, my part of the presentation and uh, uh, hand back um, uh, to you guys for, for questions. Hope there are lots of questions or perhaps questions from, from you, the moderator. Thank you so much for thank you so much for uh, the very interesting points that you made about how important it is to to involve security early. First, I'd like to jump to Oscar. Oscar, I really just want to have an opportunity to ask you a little bit more about this expectations gap that you mentioned right at the top of your talk. Uh, you were talking yeah. about that innovation generally is going to the consumer side first uh, with a lot of innovation. So, can we just talk a little bit more about that? expectations gap and how that affects the employee experience of remote work right now what what are some things that you see uh, I, I believe that one thing is for example equipment that you do sort of uh, you, you you when you're not in the office and you need to work 100 percent remotely you understand the, uh, the need to have good equipment, computer, uh, headsets, and so forth. And in many cases, we have better equipment in our private lives. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that that is one gap from an employee perspective that we are sort of not feeling that we get the latest best, best technology. Uh, I, I know customers, clients for sure that, that have stationary computers still. Like, uh, yeah. of course, at home, they have laptops. Of course, yeah. And uh, when you talked about, um, and, and of course, I'd just like to remind the, the viewers, if they have any questions, I'd love to see them. I'd love to see their questions coming up on screen now. But from, from my perspective, you, you put a slide up where you were talking about the roadmap that a lot of companies are on, and you showed that like 21% are still at that very rudimentary level, and that, you know, 41% you would even only classify as basic. So we're looking at, you know, 62% of companies are not even halfway along the journey, uh, given your mm. stats, if my mathematics is uh, working yeah. correctly. So my great. question is, is what are the things that those companies need to focus on? What are the two or three things that they could focus on that would make a really exponential difference to them? Well, uh, I believe one thing is quite basic to make uh, tools accessible. 
uh, from home uh, and elsewhere. That, that's not the case in, in a lot of organizations, like some tools, not all tools, mm -hmm. and they're also not integrated. You have different logons and so forth. Yeah. And that makes a very complex uh, work environment. Uh, that's two things, at least. Right. Um, I have to think about the third. Yeah, but if you if you think about you know I mean there's been a, also a push from the security side not to have a bring your own device policies at mm. work and if people have better equipment at home maybe an iPad they'd rather use for a meeting that's better than their laptop, you know how can companies uh, sort of start to make a, a a transition in the mentality of how they think about these these processes you know, from your perspective. I believe that like remote work and digitalization uh, or digital work in general has been like an add-on, something you can do, so you're allowed to do mm -hmm. sometimes, but now it's a necessity. Right. So it ha hasn't been treated as like the baseline of right. all work. It's just mm -hmm. been like an add-on. So they need to see it as a foundation of work. Yeah, not so just an add-on. Yeah, it's not the icing; it's the whole cake now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The physical thing is the icing. Yeah, and, and I, I wanted to also just ask you a little bit about leading virtually because I think that you have a lot of insights around this area, mm. and remote leadership is one of the biggest topics that has certainly come up in the work that I've been doing with mm. my clients, and uh, mm. the thing that I've been asked to to talk about most with my clients. What are your thoughts about? Uh, you know this leading virtually. What what are the what are some tips? What are some takeaways people can have from that? Well, I believe the the whole the key to to work virtually and uh, to bring together a remote team or remote organization is to make each other aware of what is happening. And uh, like if you know that. You don't have to have to check up on people and so forth. So, so I'm in favor of the concepts such as work out loud and and uh, like similar concepts where mm -hmm. you actually uh, create a digital trace uh, of your work, and so that people get aware of what you're doing. Yeah, uh, and you don't have to have someone controlling it. Then it's much easier to be leading virtually as a leader. Yeah, uh, if co work is like work in a visible way and there's also a, a, another benefit there with that uh, digital trace that you talked about is that you know previously some studies have shown that when people work from home they tend to do 10 to 20 percent more work on any given day because they really want mm. to be seen to be working and not being on mm. netflix and i think that yeah. that is actually you know pushing some people to working too much uh when they're mm. working virtually so i think that digital trace could have a nice affect both ways what are some of the ways that that digital trace would work because i don't think a lot of people are aware of that concept or that idea what are some ways that could work uh, some 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 traces you sort of leave uh, implicitly when you work digitally when you create plans when you when it posts and like when, when you create the task in planner and so forth and you you follow up and so forth in 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 this planner board uh, other things uh, like you can also do ex explicitly to to for example blog or post write a short summary of what you're doing and mm -hmm. why or, or depending also on the subject of course uh, but it's all all about um, working out loud to speak up uh, digitally. Some things you can sort of get a, as a byproduct of work, digital yeah. work. Some things you have to also add to that. You have yeah. to make the effort. Really interesting. And, and I've got a question that's come in from Michael in Stockholm who would like to ask uh, Frederick about ecosystems and uh, how, mm -hmm. uh, how as a security expert, how do, how do you promote ecosystems within, within an organization? So how do you promote uh, ecosystems within an organization so that you have that uh, ability to plan security into the project from the beginning so that it doesn't become this ad mm -hmm. necessary add-on in the end, but you can actually even see how successful a project could be based on its security? Mm -hmm. Awesome question. I think uh, uh, a real uh, important thing here is is uh, uh, is to focus on what you're about to deliver uh, at the end of, of a project, making sure that the, the project is successful. And um, what happens when it's not successful uh, uh, from a delivery point of view and also from a security point of view is that you're not putting uh, um, enough uh, um, 
uh, checks and balances in there to make sure that you uh, perhaps uh, put um, uh, the right uh, contracts in place with suppliers, perhaps you're not doing the right testing, perhaps you're not providing an integrated end user experience. Uh, I think Oscar mentioned one thing here, like yeah. not integrated logons and, and creating things that are not very um, accessible and easy to use. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at things from a financial perspective, the projects that don't involve security from the beginning are terribly expensive because at some point in time, someone who's head of security or head of IT will pull the handbrake or do the famous security no. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, projects are delayed, you lose revenues, uh, perhaps you need to restart projects and so on. Uh, so I think the finance uh, motivator there is key really to make sure that you you, you clearly outline uh, that security needs to be part of it from from the beginning. Yeah, and, 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 um, and I think and I think if more people if more people that, understood that, then you'd probably get more buy-in from the innovative teams wanting to strategically work with the security teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, most organizations have uh, uh, policy documents and, and rules that uh, describe what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. But they can be very, very difficult to consume and understand if mm -hmm. you're a business developer or in marketing or if you're working on, on digitizing something. It's really difficult to pull up this uh, standards-based document and read through what you need to do. So I think, um, uh, again, getting inspired from, from someone. I took the example of... Uh, of uh, uh, the healthcare industry here in my presentation, you might do it even simpler and look at what, what does a pilot do take off? Well, there's a checklist pre-takeoff. Pre Everyone yeah. knows that a plane won't take off unless you've gone through uh, some kind of checklist. Now, translate that incredibly difficult and time-consuming uh, thick document that's written by, by policy experts. Make that simple into a checklist that every project needs to start with and make sure that you, you, uh, you check through the following things from a security perspective. Get involvement from the security department. And, so and, on. and I thought that was a great thing. idea from you to have that checklist as a way to build a bridge and to use simple language and, and a simple process to enable that, um, that ecosystem or to come together that way. Uh, Frederick and Oscar, mm -hmm. we have to leave the conversation now. Really thank you for your insights and, and thank you for answering our questions. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much thank for joining much. us on the uh, Digital Workplace Summit. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.